Ni hao. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you here in China, at least virtually. My name is Stephen Axford and I take photographs of fungi. This stage I'm standing on is an endangered lowland subtropical rainforest near where I live on the north coast of New South Wales in Australia. Over the past 10 years, I've taken many photographs of mushrooms in this forest. And I've also taken photographs of mushrooms in some of the most remote forests on the planet. Photographing mushrooms has become a passion that has completely changed my view of the world. This is the first mushroom I ever photographed. Its scientific name is Cortinarius archeri. Why did I photograph it? Well, it was back in 2003. My wife had died five years earlier from breast cancer, and then I had a life-threatening illness. I'd survived both, but when you face death, it makes you rethink your life. And I was looking to reinvent myself. The wild places along the Australian coast and the ancient forests became a sanctuary for me. I was walking along a coastal track one day when I spotted this purple mushroom. I didn't even know there were purple mushrooms. And if you'd asked me what a mushroom was, I could probably tell you that it wasn't a plant, but that's about all I knew. I was a computer software engineer and I had never studied botany or zoology or any of the life sciences. But after I photographed this mushroom, I became intrigued with fungi. My view of the forest changed forever. Instead of looking up, I looked down, scouring the ground for hidden treasures. These are just a few of the mushrooms I discovered in those early days. I was very focused on color back then. This one is Hygrosibe graminicolor, a stunning green mushroom that grows in the rainforests of Tasmania. It is quite small, it's only one to three centimetres across the cap. I was very excited when I found this specimen as they are very hard to see. Moss green mushrooms growing in moss green moss. I knelt down and took the photograph, which I thought was a very special single specimen. And when I stood up, I realised I'd been kneeling in a whole patch of green mushrooms, hiding in green moss. This is a rushula, which can often be the perfect looking mushroom. They come in reds, yellows, purples and greens, with bright white gills underneath. They're very appealing to many photographers, and many are edible. Some tasty, some not so tasty, and some not edible at all. This is one of my favourite mushrooms. It's called Mycena interrupta. It appears in April and May on fallen wood in many forests in Southern Australia. Stunning, isn't it? All these species are what people generally think of as a mushroom. They have a stem, they have a cap, and they have gills. But then I started to see mushrooms that didn't look anything like this. And I realized I had a very narrow view of what a mushroom really is like this orange fungus. It is a species of Romaria. They come in a dazzling variety of colors. It looks like undersea coral, doesn't it? Which of course attracted me as a photographer. This is one of the many shelf fungus I started to see, Trametes versicolor. These fungi last a long time as they decompose large fallen logs and tree stumps. So they tend to be around even when other mushrooms are not. This one is Cordierites frondosa. It's an ascomycete, which is commonly called a cup fungus. I never knew that fungus could be such a beautiful black. Incidentally, I've been told that Cordierites group of mushrooms can be extremely poisonous. So don't be fooled by its beautiful appearance. Many people in China know this fungus. Its name is Herisium coralloides, which we know as the coral tooth fungus. We've seen it in forests in Yunnan, and the locals told us it's an edible mushroom.
When I started to discover this huge diversity of fungi, it was like someone opened my eyes. I realised there was much more to mushrooms than just different colours. What started as a photographic journey then became a journey into the science of fungi through the vehicle of photography. My first big discovery was that fungi are not plants or animals, that they are a whole separate kingdom of life. Scientists think there may be four to five million species of fungus on the planet, but so far we've only documented around 200,000 of them, so there's a lot left to learn. The photographs I take are generally mushrooms, the fruiting body of macro fungi, just like apples on a tree. Some of these fungi are saprobes. These are the recyclers of the forest, where the body of the fungus, the mycelium, a mass of branching thread-like hyphae, grows inside dead wood or leaves or in the soil, breaking down the dead vegetation. Without these saprobes, all the fallen wood in the forest would just pile up, like it did back in the Carboniferous era, over 300 million years ago, when the dead trees were gradually compressed into coal seams. The Carboniferous era ended when fungi evolved the ability to break down lignin in wood and decompose it, recycling all those nutrients back into the soil to feed the trees. Another type of mushroom that I photograph in the forest are called ectomycorrhizal fungi. These live in a mutualistic relationship with trees. They provide the trees with water, minerals and nutrients from the soil. The trees provide carbohydrates to the fungi. You might have heard of the wood wide web. That's where the mycelium connects all the trees in a forest through a vast network. To a certain extent, the trees can communicate with each other through the web perhaps warning each other of insect pests or sharing nutrients across the forest. Scientists are just starting to find out how trees use this network. But what we do know is that trees connected in the forest by a fungal network survive much better than individual trees do on their own outside the forest. Another very cool type of fungus I've been documenting in forests are the parasitic fungi. Some of these are parasitic on trees and will eventually kill the trees. Some are parasitic on insects. These are commonly called cordyceps, and we've found heaps of them, mainly in Asia, but particularly in Yunnan in China. We always get a buzz out of cordyceps because they're so difficult to find. You just see the fruiting body coming out of the ground, maybe a little orange stem, and you go, aha, there's a cordyceps. This is one of the fun side journeys I've been on as I've explored the kingdom of fungi. It's a slime mould. Now slime mould is fascinating stuff, more closely related to malaria and amoebic dysentery than it is to other life forms. It has colourful names like dog's vomit and wolf's milk, but it looks like fungi, so it tends to get lumped in with fungi. And then there are lichen. It's estimated that 6% of the Earth's land surface is covered with lichen. Isn't that amazing? Many people think that lichens are plants, but in fact they're a mutualistic symbiosis between an algae or cyanobacteria, together with two, three, or even four species of fungus. The algae provides carbohydrates to the fungus through photosynthesis, and the fungi's role is to provide the structure to the lichen. Each lichen needs its algae and all of its species of fungi to survive. Everything about lichen is complex, so I'll just stick to photographing their beauty and leave the science to those who are better qualified. The kingdom of fungi is full of cool science like this. Check out this bird's nest fungus. I often find them growing in mulch in my garden, so they're saprobes and they grow on wood. The interesting thing about these mushrooms is the way they spread their spores. You can see that there are little eggs inside the nest. Each of those is actually a spore packet and the nest is what's called a splash bucket. So when it rains, a raindrop will hit the splash bucket and splash the spore packet out of the nest, sometimes shooting it 
by as much as three metres away. Often there is a fine thread attached to the spore packet. When this hits some low vegetation, that thread wraps around a twig or a leaf, holding the spore packet above the ground. When it opens up and releases the spores, they have much more chance of spreading widely on the wind. It is a very successful means of reproduction. I'd heard that there were mushrooms that glow in the dark, particularly in the tropics. So one rainy, moonless night in summer, I decided to see if I could find them in my backyard. I find a lot of fungi in my backyard. I turned my house lights off, walked in amongst some trees growing near the creek, and turned my torch off. I was prepared to wait for several minutes to allow my eyes to adapt to the dark, because the only luminous fungi I had seen before were very faint. But as soon as I turned off my torch, there they were, little points of light amongst the undergrowth. I went closer and I found these beautiful little mushrooms glowing a soft luminous green. It was quite magical and I spent many happy hours wandering around at night photographing these beautiful Mycena chlorophos. Sometimes they were so bright I could find my way in the dark forest trails with a stick covered with the mushrooms. Finding these has opened up some incredible doors to sharing the story of fungi. They were the first mushroom that I time-lapsed. To my surprise, my wife supported the idea of filling our spare shower with rotting logs, blacking out the windows, and turning it into a time-lapse studio. But then Catherine is a filmmaker. The results surpassed our expectations. My time-lapse became more ambitious and I set up two studios, one in a shed and one in a shipping container. When the BBC saw the movies I created, they fell in love with them. They were showcased on Planet Earth 2 with David Attenborough and this sequence was listed by the BBC in their top 10 clips from that series. Since then, time lapses of Mycena chlorophos and many other species of forest fungi have been included in 10 other international natural history documentaries. Tom May, a mycologist or fungi scientist at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Melbourne, has been very supportive of our work. He says that the time lapses bring fungi alive, like a mammal. For the first time, ordinary people and scientists can see things they've never seen before. In Australia, there are only a handful of mycologists and it's challenging for them to be in the forest when the fungi fruits. So, mycologists became very interested in what my photography and the time lapses could show them about the fungi. And my role as a mere fungi photographer shifted to a role as a naturalist and a collaborator with the scientists. Just like the naturalists of the 1800s, I had the equipment, the passion for the natural world, 
and the time and opportunity to explore. I became interested in not just capturing the beauty of mushrooms, but also capturing the form and the structure with a scientific accuracy that complemented the research of the mycologists. Some of the mushrooms we find are just so different that there is little doubt that we've discovered something new. The blue was like that. I first found it about 10 years ago, quite close to my home, in this forest in fact. At first I wasn't sure it was a mushroom at all. I thought it was maybe a blue sweet wrapper on the ground. It was just so blue. I sent samples to Dr. Tom May and he identified it as a new species, similar to specimens first documented in New Caledonia. Now, a decade later, the original single species from New Caledonia has been split into three species, which look similar, but not even closely related to each other. And this blue mushroom still hasn't been given a name. I think it's a fascinating fungus and Dr. Tom May called it the most beautiful mushroom in Australia. I always try and get a time lapse of it and sometimes I succeed. Scientific collaborations like this one was the next significant stage of how fungi changed my view of the world. In 2014, I received an email from Dr. Peter Mortimer, who is a professor at the Kunming Institute of Botany, which is part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Peter and the head of department, Professor Xu Jianchu, led a team of mycologists who are doing some extremely exciting fungi research. Peter's dad in South Africa had seen my photographs on the internet and suggested that he contact me. The outcome of that first email has been four trips to Yunnan to photograph and document the fungi of the remote forests. It was on these field trips that I realised just how edible fungi can really be. In Australia, we're what's called a fungi-phobic society. In our shops, you can find only about five species of mushroom for sale, and they're pretty boring. People are generally scared to eat forest fungus. We just don't know which ones are poisonous and which ones are edible. But in Yunnan, we discovered that people eat around 900 species of fungus. Definitely a fungiphilic society. I have to confess that at home, I don't really like to eat mushrooms. But in Yunnan, we were introduced to many delicious mushrooms and local villagers shared their knowledge about what was edible and how to cook them. So this is a Belitas, this, this one is edible? Do you, yeah. you eat this one? Mm. Cool on the other. The, the this is very yeah, good. It's a kind of typical delicious eatable mushrooms. Belitas uh, eat this, right? So this is their favourite one to find. We also discovered that mushrooms in China are a huge business. Yeah, some chanterelles, we haven't seen too many of them. It was in the forests of China that we started to understand just how interdependent the trees and the animals and the fungi really are. My view of the world was changing yet again. The forest was starting to make sense. It wasn't just a bunch of trees. Even in a relatively simple forest, there are probably hundreds of thousands of life forms, all dependent on each other and all contributing to make up what we call a forest. From viruses and bacteria through to fungi, plants and animals, they are all part of the huge intricate web of life. 
and the fungi are a really important part of that ecosystem and yet we know so little about them. On the China field trips, one in seven species that we document is new to science. But even the ones that are known are truly fascinating. Here are a couple that I found really exciting. These are called Tomitomyces, and I first photographed them in Yunnan. They have a hard pointed cap which allows them to push through the ground from up to a metre below the surface. They live in a mutualistic symbiosis with termites, which means that neither species can survive without the other. The termites collect grass and wood and take it underground to their nest, where they feed it to the fungus. They then eat part of the fungus. The fungus eventually fruits, pushing the mushrooms up above the ground. Tomitomyces came as a complete surprise to me. In Australia we have plenty of termites, but no Tomitomyces. Yet many species of this fungus are found throughout tropical Asia and Africa. There is one species of this fungus that produces mushrooms up to a metre across. Many Tomitomyces are valued as a delicious edible and we often see them in markets across this region. We certainly like them. This little purple mushroom is called Lacaria amethystina and it grows mutualistically with pine trees. Villagers in Yunnan prize the mushroom as a pretty edible that looks good in any dish. I just love that it is such a beautiful colour. The most poisonous mushroom in the world is an Amanita. Amanita phylloides, more commonly known as the death cap. They grow under oak trees all over the world and every year people die from eating this mushroom. For instance, this Amanita we documented in Myanmar we think is part of the Amanita phylloides group. It may be the source of a number of recent mushroom deaths. The mycologists we were working with and village leaders were keen to document it to warn people against eating it. But this is a very similar Amanita mushroom that people in Nepal say is edible. There isn't a lot of difference between them, is there? Just to fill you in on what happens if you eat an Amanita phylloides, it is actually reported to taste quite good, but I really can't verify that. The first symptom is that you feel a bit sick the next day. After three or four days, you are so sick that you know you need to see a doctor. But by then, it is often too late. Amanita phylloides contains a poison that destroys our liver, so slowly over several weeks we die. This is a mushroom that's very well worth avoiding. So there's no doubt that photography can play an important role in educating people about these mushrooms and other poisonous mushrooms too as is its role in educating people about the fungi they can eat. The China collaboration has led to similar collaborations in Nepal, Myanmar and India, working with organisations focused on conservation and helping local people manage their forests in a sustainable manner. Often as roads are put in, forests are cut down, much to the detriment of the local people. The edible forest fungi that could be used for food or trade often vanishes with the forests. So the photographs have been used to produce a number of field guides for villages in these countries. But for me the most exciting part has been to document all of the fungi in these remote areas and learning a tiny bit of how each one interacts with the forest. And the fungi in the eastern Himalayas has been absolutely superb. In the last year, our role as fungi educators has taken on an even wider vision. On these international fungi adventures, we are often introducing our collaborators to fungi for the very first time. We watch with joy as they become excited about this world that they had never noticed before. Every time we see them become almost as passionate and obsessed as we are. 
and we want to see if we can make this happen on an international scale. So in India in 2018, we filmed our whole fungi safari. Here's a little taste of what we did. This is a scene where we document, for the very first time, a luminous fungi in Megalia. A fungus species I time-lapse that never ceases to wow is Mycenochlorophos. It's a very bright, luminous fungus that I find in my local forests. Wherever we go, we always ask if there is a local variety. Usually the answer is no. So do you have any mushrooms here that glow in the dark? Yes. You do? Yeah. So do you find many of them? Yes, of course. What do you call these mushrooms? This is called bright mushroom because it will give out the light in the night time. Can we go down and find some? Sure, I'll go and take you. That's brilliant. Wow, look at these. They're nothing like the fungus we get at home. The stems glow, yeah. but the caps don't glow, whereas at home, yeah. the caps glow and the stems only glow, glow a little bit. Uh -huh. So it's the same thing but different species. <laughs> same, same but different, yes. Now you really can't see these with the light on them, but we'll, we'll get them up in the dark and I can photograph them with long exposure and then you'll really see them in their full glory. Great. There are currently around 80 species of luminous fungus recorded on the planet, but only a handful of them glow as brightly as this one. This is the first time Malinong's luminous fungus has ever been documented, and when its DNA was analysed, we discovered it's a new species. Now I'm going to take you back to my home in Australia. In 2019, we experienced one of the worst bushfire seasons we had ever seen. 17 million hectares of land was burnt, over 5 million in my state of New South Wales alone. It was very frightening and destructive, and particularly scary when it started burning the rainforest near where we live. Days after the fire had been through, we started hearing reports from firefighters that mushrooms were appearing in the ash. So we drove up to the blackened landscape to see what we could find. We were amazed. There were lots of fungi, and they were species that we had never seen before. This one is what's called a stonemaker fungus. It started to appear a day or two after the fire, while the ground was still hot and smoking. It lives in the earth for many years and forms a hard mycelium lump underground, which resembles a stone, hence the name. It only fruits when there's fire, which in this particular forest may happen only once in a hundred years. Then we saw masses of tiny cup fungi covering the ground. We managed to identify them as Anthracobia mulleri. We started to wonder about its role in protecting the forest soil as fire tends to make the soil very fragile and easily washed or blown away. But this fungus appeared to be binding the surface soil together and locking in any moisture. For me, these fungi raise so many questions. Where does this fungi live when there's no fire? It has no deep mycelial reserve that I could see. I'd read that there was a similar fungus in North America, which lived as a microscopic fungus in the cellular structure of mosses. Perhaps this did something similar and only became a macrofungus when the fire had sterilised the soil of all competing organisms. We even found mushrooms in gaps underneath charcoal, where there had once been fallen logs on the forest floor. This would have been where the fire was its very hottest. How could this happen? How could spores make their way into the soil that had been completely sterilised by the fire? The variety of fire-loving fungi was astounding. And then when we went back a month later, there were different fungi coming up. We published a few videos and the response surprised us. Many of the locals told us they were uplifted by this positive information in amongst all the news of destruction. They were heartened to hear just how resilient the forest could be. 
thanks in this case to its fungi. Life is such a wonderful thing and we know so little about almost all of it. As I told you at the start, I used to work as a computer software engineer on very large computer systems and systems that we think of as being very complex. But a computer system is designed by humans and get enough of us together and we can explain everything about them. But even the smallest system in the natural world is more complex than the largest computer system. And then when you consider that there are trillions or even quadrillions of organisms on the planet, we start to get a sense of just how complex life on Earth really is. I started on this journey knowing a little bit about photography, but very little about the natural world. Learning about the complexity of fungi and through it the complexity of life, I realise now that life on this planet is more interconnected than I ever could have imagined. We are just one organism in that story, and yet we have the means to destroy it all, including ourselves, because we cannot survive on our own. With all the extraordinary tools we have created, humans have a wonderful opportunity to learn and conserve. One of the scientists we collaborated with in India said, you can't conserve a forest ecosystem if you don't know what's there. And I feel we have been handed this wonderful opportunity to help document a very small part of this complexity and share it with you. From one photograph of a very small purple mushroom on the ground, I've been taken on a journey that reveals the very big picture of life on this planet. Thank you.